Continuing, seventh grade. Around the seventh grade, some of us male students got into a new game called Dungeons and Dragons. When it first came out, it was a role-playing game with a couple of several-sided dice and a booklet, but no board. Not having the constraints of a board to play on and within inspired a lot of young people who wanted to think beyond that. It played on the imagination and not the appeal of the imagination of the writers of the game. This was in the early 80s and video games were coming into real popularity. We rarely had money or access to video games as they were still all at the convenience stores and arcades. But we could take a booklet, some dice, and a pad and pencil anywhere. So we took all that with us to recess and play. It was me, Norman, Jacobson, O'Reilly, and Foreman, and sometimes Jimmy, though he didn't much enjoy intellectual pursuits. We took our game to the steps of the back wall of our seventh grade classroom out in the parking lot. We had to be secluded from the other kids making so much noise on the field or in the bleachers. In Dungeons and Dragons, we could be larger and more powerful than just Catholic schoolboys. We hunted and stalked and hid out and then jumped out and pounced on any unlucky travelers along our path. We collected their gold coins and jewelry, if they had any, and rejoiced as a band of merry thieves should. Whenever an ogre or a demon came along, we would have a problem. We managed, though. A great quality of that game is that you can play out a scene in slow motion and really analyze and plan your situation much better. Having options greatly appealed to us. We weren't used to that. If a problem arose, we'd have time, at least until recess was over, to organize, theorize, strategize, and initiate a group effort aimed at some heroic Middle-Earth success. I felt that games like that, that really make you think, were better by far than the religion that was being indoctrinated into us. The Bible contains talk of a variety of mythical creatures as well, but the real focus in that book is the people. Well, we were bored with people, especially religious people, who were very predictable, the Bible also included so many horrific acts against other people, atrocities without reason, and even as a kid, I knew that made for a bad story. We had to pretend to embrace that bad story every day. I learned to be an actor because of this without any formal training. I thought this school had to be like college for acting. Every day was an exercise in careful, focused dishonesty. We had to escape dishonesty, and we found that fantasy was an interesting replacement. I ignored the obvious similarities between the two, however. My mother once bought me a book about a space traveler who visits other planets and risks life and limb. This book was unique, though, because the reader got to make decisions for the lead character. It would say, if you want to see our hero jump through the plate glass window to escape, possibly causing himself further injury, turn to page 9. If you want our hero to stand and fight, turn to page 10. And page 9 would continue the story in a more frightening and thus shorter-lived direction. Page 10 would continue the story in a way that would lead to more options. The whole book was like a small pocketbook, very convenient to carry. It contained around a dozen options, each with two resulting directions in the story. That may not sound like much in the way of options presented, but when you're a kid and you spend most of your time being obediently silent and still, any options are welcome. We almost didn't know what to do with decision-making freedom over ourselves. We needed practice. Looking back, it was very odd that we played that game out in the open without any complaint from anyone. The nuns and priests all knew, and the principal and the lay teachers all knew. It didn't seem to relate to the stories in the Bible, or at least we didn't recognize any correlations. That's probably because they didn't want to focus much on the satyrs and dragons and demons that are in the Bible. We spent years attending masses in and out of school time, and there were only two places designed for those masses, the church and the liturgy room in the school. There was only one mass I can recall that took place outside of those two places. For a few weeks during school time, the church underwent some renovations. The inside only, and only around the altar area, but it was a lot of work, and it made a big mess in the church. So for one school week mass, we were all herded into the gymnasium. Hundreds of folding metal chairs were set up in the gym, and all facing one way. We filed in with the rest of the school and took our seats. It was nice to have my own seat for a mass, even if it was a hard and cold brown metal folding chair. The priest wore the same colorful ceremonial robe we would see him wearing during masses in church. It seemed out of place in the gym, though. There were no candles, no statues, no gold, 
and there was no incense, but there was a lot of light. I remember thinking that the gym made a great place to have a mass, since we could really think clearly there compared to when we were in church. The church was designed to have a solid psychological effect on pew occupants. The gym was more practical. It smelled like a gym and not a church. The mass was long and boring and pointless, like all other Catholic masses I ever attended. But I also made this mass one to remember. In all the years I attended masses, I never saw anyone drop the host. I saw a lot of funny things happen to hosts, but not that. It seemed like a mortal sin to drop Jesus on the floor, but I did it. We were in line. When it was my turn, the priest said the standard whispered call, the body of Christ, and I said the standard reply, Amen. Then he put the host into my hand and I dropped it onto the gym floor. The priest actually got down and picked it up for me, which was difficult. It was like picking up a penny off the sidewalk. It's hard to get hold of something so flat and flush to the ground. The priest seemed to take forever to pick Jesus up. I looked around, stunned, and saw that several other people had seen my error and were now stunned as well. I even heard at least one gasp. The priest finally got Jesus off the floor and repeated the whole process. The body of Christ again and amen again. This time I got it right. I wasn't about to let Jesus get away from me this time. I crammed him inside my mouth and chewed with a vengeance. He wasn't going to escape this time. This probably seems odd to anyone who has never been a Catholic or belonged to another host-addicted denomination. Hell, it's odd to me. Bizarre, in fact. But we live the very physical life of religious Catholicism. Dropping the host was a serious error, yet it didn't earn me any trouble with the priest or teachers. Apparently, humans can make mistakes while holding the only perfect person in their hands. The change from host to ritual body of Christ means that the consecrated host is very special. You don't just drop it. Well, I dropped it, and totally on accident. To this day, I'm proud of that error because it's the closest Jesus ever came to being human in my eyes. Another real human making a mistake while in physical contact with Jesus. Well, that's about the closest Jesus ever came to being like me, a real person. Around my time in seventh grade, another host issue came up. For decades, the church had given out the white wafer hosts for communion, and that was fine. Even though it was dry, bland, and probably not sanitary, the standard white host worked for most people. Then some Catholics got together somewhere and asked the church to come up with an alternative form of host that didn't taste so bland and dry. Something that didn't conjure up feelings of apathy towards the supposed value of that little host. So the church made up a new form of host. This was a breakthrough, we thought. They took a large loaf of sweet bread and broke off little bits of it for each person. It was a little piece of sweet bread, brown, and about the size of a marble. Well, that tasted much better, and we all said so. The nuns had asked us our opinions on it, and we quickly made it known that most of us were opting for the new sweet bread host. Again, if you've never been Catholic, this may not seem important, but they were changing the way Jesus entered our bodies. They changed the form Jesus took, essentially. They changed Jesus for us, because we didn't like the version of Jesus before. It was nasty, some said. The church changed something that important because some parishioners asked for it. That is an amazing thing. Eventually, we students had discussed this change amongst ourselves, and we discovered that most of us preferred the new host. We figured they may have to plan ahead for this popularity shift and buy more sweet bread than they expected. The buying and selling of religious articles eluded us as it was done almost in secret. We only saw the finished product. We all quietly thanked the little old lady somewhere who we were convinced was making this tasty new host. We theorized that they may eventually drop the old white host in favor of the new, more popular kind. But then reality set in and we realized that there are plenty of Catholics who will resist even this kind of change. The wafer hosts were there to stay and the priest simply did more work during the consecration.
Eventually, the boys in our grade were all asked if we'd like to become altar boys. This was not a sacrament or any kind of requirement. It wouldn't give us better grades or any other real rewards, but it would get us out of class for a few hours per week. Altar boys had to rehearse and take classes on how to do things they have to do. I said no thanks immediately. I didn't want to do any more work for the church than I was already doing. That was a lot of work already. I also didn't think that getting out of class only to go hang out with some priests was much of an appealing enticement. I was thirsty for a secular time. Several of the boys went for it though. Nolman, Jacobson, Durga, Black, Ronan, O'Reilly, Foreman, and Vargas. Of course, Jimmy Berkman and Tony Munoz did, since they were the most religious boys in our entire school, it seemed. The altar boys wore a red and white robe combination that made them all look the same, cut from some old world ideal about what a young man should look like. The only human parts showing were the head and the hands. They were servants for the priests while the mass was happening. Each mass would necessitate at least two altar boys, and some masses involved up to six. I was most surprised to see John Nolman in the uniform of the altar boy. He was as independent-minded as I was, possibly more. This seemed to lock him into an even less enjoyable school day. I don't know if he enjoyed himself, but it looked like work from the pews. They would have to first walk up the aisle, each carrying a large candle, in the procession with the celebrant the priest and everyone else involved in putting on the mass. So for a school mass on Tuesday, it would be the priest, a student to give the first reading, and two altar boys. They would march slowly up to the altar area to the sounds of the church band, usually just a couple of guitarists. Then at various times during the mass, the altar boys carried candles, lit candles, put out candles, and then held the Bible for the priest. When it came time for the homily, also called the sermon, the altar boy's job was to bring the oversized Bible to the priest at his lectern. When it came time to give out communion, the priest and both of the altar boys would typically all go to the front of the center aisle and give out communion to congregants who were waiting in line. For school masses, there would be only one adult involved with the communion, so any classes that were seated on the left or right sides of the church would have to get their communion in the center section in the same line with the people from the center section. It was all very mechanical and routine. The altar boys used to hold a brass plate with a handle under the congregant's chin as they took communion. But since the congregation has been allowed to take communion in their hands, our church hasn't had the brass plate. The altar boys are there now to hold the wine or extra hosts. Just having altar boys very visually involved in the mass sent a clear psychological message that implied that the work that was going on at the altar was important work. That anyone from the student body would be asked to help out only sealed in the idea of teamwork in those who participated. Again, I refused to take part in that, as I was already overwhelmed with religion as it was. Around the middle of my seventh grade year at Holy Ghost, my right knee began to give me some problems. It hurt to walk, so of course it hurt worse to kneel. It swelled up a bit, just a little, but enough to be visibly noticeable. I told my parents about my knee, and my father took me to a doctor. Some x-rays were done and lots of poking and prodding and questioning. At first, we were at a loss as to why my knee was giving me problems at all. It seems that the lubricating fluid in between the cartilage of the bottom of the upper leg bone and the cartilage on the top of the lower leg bone had dissipated significantly. That fluid is like oil for an engine. Without it, parts rub too hard against other parts, causing a terribly fast wearing down of those parts. Even cartilage, which seems to be designed to absorb the friction between leg bones, isn't nearly enough to sustain that kind of impact and movement for a lifetime. There was less lubricating fluid, so the swelling was the cartilage which was inflamed. The doctor couldn't figure out why there was insufficient fluid there. So we all sat around and went over the physically demanding things I had to do at Holy Ghost on a regular basis. I immediately thought of the football I had been playing during recess. Later on, it occurred to me that I didn't kneel while playing football. I only knelt when I was required to, during prayer or masses. 